everybody. People are finding their way in, but we are so glad that you're here this morning. And welcome to everybody who is watching online. We're glad that you're joining with us this morning as well. How many of you have had a great week this week? Can I just see your hands? How many of you have had a not so great week? Can I see your hands? How many of you aren't going to raise your hand no matter what I say? Let me just see a few of those. Well, whatever your week has been like, good, bad, ugly, or otherwise, I am so glad that you're here because there's something that happens when we gather together and we meet in God's presence and He's here and we feel His presence. And we're going to be talking about that today. We're in a series called Divine Encounters and we've been looking at places where people had a real encounter with the living God and how it changes you and how it changes your worldview and your thought process and how it helps prepare you and change you and, and opens up the door for God to use you in a powerful way. And so we're going to be talking about that today. So let's do this as we get ready to start into the service. If you would, just raise your hands with me. Let's welcome God into this place. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your presence. We say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Fill this place. Father, we thank you so much for your great love, your mercy, your grace. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice for us. We worship you. We lift you up. We bless your name, Lord Jesus, and pray, Father, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody, and good morning to everyone online. We're so glad you could be with us this morning.
separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have your mercies for me every day Your love never fails
Lord, we all come into this place broken in different ways. But Lord, you need us right where we are. Lord, you don't ask us to get fixed up, cleaned up, slicked up. You take us with great love just as we are. And as we wake up this morning, Lord, as our spirits awaken to that truth, Lord, let us rejoice in you that we have a Father who delights in us. Waking up to a new sunrise Looking back from the other side Oh, I can see now with open eyes Darkest water and deepest pain I wouldn't trade it for anything Cause my brokenness brought me to you And these wounds are the story
what you did out of that great, great, great love for us. That you endure not just the pain, Lord, but the humiliation, the separation from the Father at the cross. And so, Lord, we sing this song this morning, but Lord, we will sing this song forever that we are thankful for the scars that Jesus endured that we might have life and life everlasting. We bless you, Lord. We bless you in this place this morning. We give you praise. We give you worship. We adore you. And we lift up your name. Amen. Well, good morning again to everybody. It's wonderful to see you. Um, although I've kind of seen you guys. Mostly I see Robert and the band. <laughs> um, but uh, it's good to be back. It's good to be back and just here worshiping with you guys. So, and worshiping with the band, you know. Um, we, uh, we worship at home, to be sure, and I'm so grateful for uh, your prayers and the cards and just the encouragement. Britt stepping up and last week having Amber and James here. It was just really a blessing. So I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. Um, and uh, keep Britt in prayer. His uh, father-in-law passed about a week ago. And uh, so he was up with family and uh, they're doing really well. His dad was a very strong believer, loved by a lot of people. So the family had very good support. So that's a cool thing. Um, just real briefly, uh, that song, yeah, it, it made me think about a lot of things. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we, we all have that penchant for saying funny things like, yeah, I need that like I need another hole in the head. Well, I got a hole in the head. So what can you do? Um, but I, I was thinking about it, you know, th these last five plus years have just been so crazy with multiple cancers and other stuff and finally kind of culminating in having brain surgery two months ago. And... Uh, I think even from the time like I was a little kid, I'd go to the dentist and I'd go, oh, it's not the same because he, he had to drill in a tooth or something, you know, so you're not quite the same. And maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe other people can relate to that, that feeling that something's changed, you know, and I'm not quite the same person that I was. But now as, you know, uh, an adult walking in Christ, it's kind of like, well, duh, yeah. I mean, that's just the way it is. Jesus is transforming us. His, his word says that the spirit is changing us from glory to glory. And glory's a great word. It sounds wonderful, right? But glory's not always this. Sometimes it's some really hard things that we have to endure. Sometimes it's pain. Sometimes it's loss and it's suffering and it's uh, loneliness, sometimes even feeling separate from God, like, God, where are you in the midst of these things? But he's working. He's working. And um, I took great comfort thinking about in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, starts out, brothers continue in love, right? And then there's a discourse that happens. And I think you may have even mentioned something about this not too long ago, but verse 8 is really interesting because just out of nowhere, it seems, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you're like, okay, well, but what he's really saying is God's faithful. He doesn't change these things that I'm telling you. These are a reflection of the nature of Jesus that he so desires for us to have within us and toward one another and toward those who don't know him to be that, that witness and that testimony. And I, I am changed. I mean, it's different. I can't hear out of my left ear right now. I don't know if it's going to be permanent. It might be permanent. Uh, you know, there's other stuff you kind of deal with. I mean, you know, somebody goes in your brain, even somebody really good, you know, they're kind of where, I don't know. I'm glad he went there, but you know, you just kind of wonder. <laughs> so <clears throat> we change, but God doesn't change. His love, his faithfulness, he can't deny himself. Even when we're faithless, he's faithful. And James says that, you know, all of these gifts, all of these things that God blesses us with, they come from the Father in whom there is no shadow, no variance, no turning from his nature of who he is. And 
man, I can change all, all I want or all that's necessary. I don't care because I know he's faithful. He doesn't change. And that's the rock that I can hold on to. So I just want to encourage you this morning. If you're challenged with things in your life right now, you're going through difficult things, Jesus isn't going to change. He's not going to go, well, I had you yesterday, but I, I don't have you today. Sorry. Just I got other things going on. Or, Oops. In fact, he says, every one that the Father commits into my hand, I won't lose one. So, praise God. Good to see you guys. Why don't, uh, why don't you guys have a seat, relax, and we're going to watch a little video here. I am seeking, searching for the things this world has rejected, the things that are broken, that are flawed, thrown away and discarded. I seek the lost, the damaged, the forgotten things, the overlooked and the neglected. The things that have been pushed aside and left behind. Why? Why do I do this? Why chase after that which is despised by so many? It is because I have chosen the rejected. I bring restoration to the broken. I see beyond the flaws and the imperfections, and I bring new life to the lost. This world has called them useless and garbage, hopeless and unwanted. They have been scarred, abused, ignored, and unloved, but I, I have reclaimed them, and they belong to me now. They are my masterpiece, and I have a plan and a future for every single one. For I am crafting these dissonant and discarded pieces into something beautiful. Have you been sensing kind of a theme through this morning, right? Kind of, you know, kind of feeling it. You know, I've been saying all throughout this series that my hope is in God, my trust is in God. And when we can come to Him in our brokenness, God can meet us there and make something beautiful out of our pain. And I believe that. Do you? Well, congrats to everybody who just finished up 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so proud of all of you guys. And I believe that it's just better when we pray, right? I mean, it's just better. Something happens when we're praying, and that's who we are. We're a church that prays and fasts and trusts God and believes Him to do great things. And we believe that God is going to do something great in our community because we trust Him. We're, we're relying on Him. We're looking to Him. We're praying to Him. We're listening to Him, and we're acting on what He's saying to do. And so that's just a great place to be. I want to say again hello to everybody who is watching online. We're so glad that uh, you joined with us this morning. Feel free to uh, jump up and down. Even though you're in your living room, you may be in your pajamas, just jump up and down and you know, shout to the Lord and uh, raise your hands and all of that. It's okay. Nobody's going to see you, not like everybody else here, right? But we're so glad that you joined us. I want to tell you, if you uh, are watching on Facebook Live right now, hit the share button. That's a great way to invite people to church online. And uh, again, we're glad that you're here. Can we give them a warm welcome this morning? Great having Jeff back. I'm just so excited to see him. And what a miracle of all that God has done uh, in his life. And it just proves that prayer makes a difference, that it changes things and it changes lives. And again, we're just so glad to have him back. We are in part three of a four-part series that we're really kind of hoping is a theme for the year. It's called Divine Encounters. 
And, and, you know, thank God for church services and church programs and the things that we physically do in church life. But I want more encounters with God. I mean, I really do. I want those experiences that change my life. And we believe that God will do that on si- inside of each and every one of us. And the scriptures are clear that God can be found. That if you seek him, you can find God. And there's different experiences in the presence of God. And I believe that we all have a, a part in that, a role in that. I believe that God wants us to have more close encounters where we experience him in a powerful way. So what we're doing is, in the series, we've been looking at different God encounters, different encounter stories, and looking at how that happens and trying to discover what is our role in that. And honestly, man, I'm just telling you, I'm desperate for that. There's something inside of me that's longing for that and longing for God's presence and all of that. Because, well, I think we do a pretty good job of presenting Christ here on a Sunday morning. I don't want your entire faith to rest on a message. I want it to rest on, I felt him. I've experienced him. God is real. He's alive. He's here in this place. He's here in my life. He's moving in my heart. And so I'm just so glad to know him. And see, what happens is, when that happens in your life, you look at your life and go, you know, my life is different because I know my God. And your attitude, your opinion, your mind changes because you've had an encounter with God. And so I'm desperate to have more of those. And Paul said, Paul says, you know, your faith didn't come with eloquence of, of, of speech or superior wisdom, but it rests on God's power. So we're doing everything we can to approach God in that way. And in week one, we talked about how God loves to encounter us in those areas where we're struggling in our life, where those areas that we're wrestling. And we, we called that message WrestleMania, right? And I think all of us have some WrestleMania going on in our life, where God is touching our life in those areas where we're wrestling with something, whether it's an addiction, an attitude, maybe it's a person, you know, somebody in our life, maybe it's something that happened in our past, but God deals with us in those areas that we're wrestling. And if you weren't here, you can listen to that message online on our Coast website, our Facebook page, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, we're just all over the place, lots of places to go back and listen. And then last week, we talked about how in most God encounters, in fact, I think every single one of them, before God sends you on a mission or asks you to do something, he zeroes in on some things in your life, and he wants to do some things inside of your character. He wants to work in you. In other words, most of us have insecurities, and we see ourselves in the wrong way. Our identity can be messed up and that sort of thing. We have a view of ourselves that is not the God view. And the God view is the right view because he's the one who made you. This is a little rhyme for you as we start our our, our morning. But God made you so he knows who you really are, who you were created to be. And I think, I, I meet so many people who are struggling with their identity or struggling with insecurities. And I'll be honest with you, last week was a special message for me because that's something I have to deal with. In my life, there's little insecurities that keep trying to gnaw away, and you have to put them under the blood of Christ and say, I'm not, I'm going to reject that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reject that thought, and I'm going to let God thoughts come into my life and overcome that. And so what happens is, in those encounters, God always deals with our character before he calls us to do something great. And all encounters, listen to me, all encounters have an assignment. We're going to get into that today. God always has something he wants you to do that will bring meaning to your life. Now today, I want to talk about how God moves on your darkest days. You know, I'm talking about that day where you get the worst news of your life, or the day where you have the greatest tragedy of your life, the day day where you lose someone you deeply love, the day where you're grieving and you're in more emotional pain than you've ever experienced in your life. And I've been a pastor a long time. And I've noticed that when you're going through something like that, here's what happens. There seems to be this little resistance that kind of comes along that kind of makes you want to move away from God, right? It just it makes you want to move away from God. And you find yourself wondering, why is this happening? And you erroneously try to put some of that blame on God. But you need to know that God's posture in this is very different. In fact, the scriptures say this. It says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. 
Like, like when he sees you in that condition, you need to know that God is making a move towards you. And I just want you to recognize that so that you can benefit from it. Because truthfully, when it comes to pain, most of us, myself included, we just need to learn how to have a better response to pain in our life. And some of you are thinking, but, but, but wait, Pastor. I mean, isn't it God's job to keep us away from pain? And the answer is no. He never promises that. In fact, in the Bible, Jesus says this. This is the words of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. Not you might, not you could, not maybe. It's going to happen. But then Jesus also says this. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Yea, for Jesus, right? Thank God for Jesus, right? He's overcome the world. See, his promise was not to rescue you from all your pain, but to give you the strength to stand strong in the midst of your pain. Amen? Amen. That's what he does. Now, in heaven, there is no pain. Come on, somebody. I love that. There's going to be a day where there's going to be no more pain, no more crying, no more weeping. The, the, the hot donut light, Krispy Kreme light is always on, right? I mean, that's going to be heaven. That's what we're looking forward to, right? That sounds pretty good coming out of the fast, right? You know? Yeah, there's a place that's perfect. But listen to me. It's not here. It's not here. So what God does is he recognizes that we're going to have those times of pain and God comes and he helps us and he gives us the strength and the courage and the fortitude and the ability to put our trust in him and know that he's going to be there in the midst of our pain. And that's powerful. That's powerful. So when you're going through your darkest days, God is moving towards you. He's close. And what he does is he moves to you in those dark times when you get that health news or, or you get that relational news or something's happened in your job. The Bible says that he saves those who are crushed in spirit. That that's how the way God works in our life. And that's powerful. I can tell you firsthand that that's true. In fact, every major life lesson I've ever learned has happened during some of those tough times. Uh, it's just the way God works. It came on not so good days. I mean, almost every major life lesson I've ever had. See, pain doesn't have to be a problem. It can be a platform for God to do something great in your life. You just have to recognize it, realize that he's working. So our passage or our message title for today, everybody ready? No pain, no gain, right? You know that phrase, right? Everybody, no pain, no gain, right? And, and, and uh, that's, that's, you know, that's something that's very, very important. That's the phrase they use in the gym, by the way. Not, not that it looks like I've ever even been in the gym. But, but the, you know, when you're in the gym and you're, you're working on the weights and you're doing the reps and you get to that last rep and you can't quite get there and they're going, come on, keep pushing. You go, my arms feel like jelly. I don't think I can do it. And they go, no pain, no gain, right? And you push through and you make it through. And they talk you into resistance for the sake of benefit. See, everything in your head, everything in your brain is going, why am I torturing myself? Vicki and I, uh, after, after I had my heart attack last year, we got this exercise bike. and You can watch classes online as you exercise, as you ride the bike. And sometimes I'm on that thing and I'm riding and I'm thinking, why am I torturing myself, right? And there's kind of a community of people that are involved in this. And, you know, I hear some of them saying, you know what, the more I ride, the more I want to ride. And I go, where do you get that kind of mindset? What are you talking about? The more I ride, the more I ride. I mean, the more I ride, the more I want a, a Krispy Kreme donut. Right? I mean, the more, I, it's not the way it works for me. Or, or you ever talk to people that talk about getting that runner's high? You know, I just get this runner, I just hit this place. I'm in the zone, man. I'm in the zone, dude. I'm just going along. I've got this runner's high and everything's going on. Going, are you crazy? That never happens to me. I get like a recliner high, right? You know, if you get in the recliner, you know, and you go, yeah, I'm in the zone. That's, that's what I get, right? So I've never had that happen. I want to slap somebody every time I hear them say, I got a runner's eye, right? It doesn't work for me. See, everything inside of our brain comes along and resists pain. But I want you to understand, pain can serve a purpose in your life. And I want to talk about that a little bit this morning by showing you an encounter that one of the guys in the Bible had 
that was very powerful. It was so powerful that this person literally, he didn't see a burning bush or, or you know, an angel appearing to be a man. He saw a vision of God himself in this vision. And it's the prophet Isaiah. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. It's going to be our text for today. If you don't have your Bible, it's okay. It's on the screen. It's in your message notes. If you have our app, you can follow along and find it there as well. In Isaiah chapter 6, it begins by saying, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, Uzziah was a friend of Isaiah. He, he was the king, but, but, but Isaiah had been advising him, and they had developed this close relationship. And uh, Uzziah had just passed away, and Isaiah was mourning the loss of his friend. When King Uzziah was alive, uh, Israel was a great nation. And Uzziah started off as a great king. He didn't finish well, uh, but, but he started off as a great king. And, and when he died, the whole nation kind of went into decline. And it was a time of national grief and mourning. And it was on that occasion that Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. I mean, I was in this time of grief. I was in this time of mourning. And I got a vision of God. And what you'll realize in this small, short account is that when he saw the Lord, he saw three things. And I want you to see These three things, because they're the same three things that God wants you to realize on your bad days. Because these three things will happen if you know how to look for them. See, my job is to prepare you for those bad days, because we're all going to have them. I mean, I hate to tell you that, because I know some of you are going, boy, this is really encouraging, Robert. I mean, thanks, Pastor. I mean, you're really speaking to me now. I'm, I'm so stoked about this idea of having bad days and all of that sort of stuff. And you're going, really, seriously, can't you be more positive? And I'll go, okay, I am positive you're going to have bad days. It's going to happen. There's going to be, I mean, you, everybody has that mix. Sometimes life is like a roller coaster, right? And so when it happens, I want you to look at what happened to to, to Isaiah. He's having this bad day. He's lost his friend. He's hurting. He's mourning. He's grieving in his spirit. And he says, I saw the Lord. And he was high. One translation says he was lifted up. He was exalted. He was seated on the throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Now the train of the robe he's wearing is so big that it filled the temple. The train represents the majesty of the one who is wearing it. And this one was so big that it filled the whole temple because our God is a big God and he's a majestic God. Amen, somebody? Right? And so it was so big. And it said, above him were seraphim. Now those are little angels. Uh, If you believe the artists that paint them, they paint them as little fat babies with wings. And uh, I don't think they look like that at all. All right? But, But anyway... It says, and they were, they were filled, and the seraphims were there, and they were calling to one another, and they were saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His, say it with me, glory, glory. His glory is everywhere. His glory is everywhere. His glory is with Isaiah during his problems. His glory is with you during your problems. His glory is with you on your rough days. His glory was with us this week as we found out that Vicky's mom died unexpectedly. And we had to deal with that, but we felt God's presence. And we felt him. He's there in your pain. He's there in your grief. He's there in the middle of your financial crisis. Come on, somebody. God shows up. And so Isaiah realized that that God is bigger than any problem he's facing. I'm just trying to preach to you a little bit this morning, right? That God is big. And I promise you, I promise you honestly that that, that when, when I went through a year and a half ago when my mom died, I just saw the Lord. I saw the Lord when I was going through that time of burnout about eight years ago. Man, I saw the Lord when I had that heart attack last year. I mean, I saw the Lord and I realized that God was still working, that he was big, that he was majestic, that his train filled the temple. And then he is a God to be lifted up and exalted and glorified. And we got to stop making him so small. He's a big God. And so... So that's what's going on there in Isaiah's head. He's realizing, he's getting this vision of this big guy, God. And it says, at the sound of their voices, talking about the cherubim, 
the doorpost and thresholds. Now, now, doorpost and thresholds represents the foundations of our lives. It said the doorpost and the thresholds shook. I mean, he's so powerful. He's saying, you know what? I got you. I've got you. And see, that's one of the reasons why when I worship, I like to sing songs about the majesty of God. Because you know what it does? It gets my mind off of me. And it puts it on a God who is so much bigger than me. It reminds me of how big he is. That's why we just need to realize, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes, that when something is happening to me, God wants to reveal himself in me. When something is happening to me, God wants to reveal himself in me. All right? He wants to shake our doorpost. He wants to shake our thresholds and say, I got this. You're going to be okay. I've got you. See, I've got this theory, and uh, this is maybe for those of you who might be disappointed with God this morning, and I'm convinced, and, and write this down, trust me. In fact, find me in heaven, you know, when we're, we're all there together, and, and you'll see that this is true. I believe you'll say, oh, yeah, you were, you were right. Because I believe that there's going to be this moment where we're all in heaven together before the throne of God, and there's just going to be this collective moment of, Oh, <laughs> right? See, we think it's all going to be organ music and ah, right? No, I think it's going to be oh, right? And maybe a little oh, right? Is there a little of that too, right? Because it's going to be us having that moment where we're realizing that God is there and he's real and he's powerful and he's working in our way, in our lives in a mighty way. You come find me in heaven and tell me that, that I was right. All right. Now, the second thing that happened with Isaiah in this passage is not only did he see how big God was over his problems and over his bad day, over his grief that he was dealing with King Uzziah dying. It's like, yeah, all this is going on, but I've got a God whose train fills the temple. He's a big and powerful and mighty God. And listen to me, you've got to get that inside of you you got to get that deep in your spirit. You need that. That's going to help you make it through. That's going to help you push through those moments where life just seems crazy, where everything seems to be falling apart. That's going to be the thing that's going to be your boundary. It's going to be something, you know, my God is big. He's powerful. He's got me. It's inside of me, and I know he's real. I've encountered him. I've experienced him, and he's not going to let me down. I'm all right. Listen, if you're going to survive, yeah, if you're going to do it, do it. Listen, if we're going to survive in this crazy world and all the things that we see going on around us, we have to have a relentless faith and trust in our almighty God that is big and powerful and working in our lives. This is so important. All right? So the second thing then that happened with Isaiah uh, is that after he has this revelation of how big God is and how powerful and how mighty, then everything kind of hits him. And he has another reaction. And he says in Isaiah 6, verse 5, Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. Like, what am I doing here? Right? And honestly, I think sometimes when we're in the presence of God, we act the wrong way. And, 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 and this is going to help you a lot if you'll, just, if you'll just track with me. See, sometimes when we get a vision of God, we see God and he's powerful and he's mighty and yes, he's loving, he's kind, he is love. But we also realize in that moment that he's a consuming fire, right? Like, whoa, oh man, I'm not even sure I should be here, right? Isaiah looks and he gets this vision of God, sees how big and majestic he is and all of a sudden it kind of hits him and he says, I am a man of unclean lips. Not only that, but I live among a people of unclean lips. So not only am I unclean, so are you guys. (laughs) You know, it ain't just me. It's all of us. We're all in the same ship. Compared to God, we're unclean, right? And 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 he's looking and he's probably thinking, you know what? I think we should probably all just like slowly back out of the room. You know, kind of work our way out. And what he's having is he has this great revelation with a bad response, all right? It's not not really what we want because the truth is, and, and you can write this down, is that when we see God clearly, we see ourselves clearly. 
When we see God clearly, we see ourselves clearly. When we see how big God is, we start to see ourselves differently. Like we'll get a revelation of, man, I've got this big God. He's big. He's powerful. He's mighty. And he needs to do a big work in me. We see it. It becomes real to us. And one of the prayers that I like to pray, and I prayed this this morning, right? But I love to pray it, especially during worship, is God, reveal yourself to the people that are in this room. Just give them a revelation of you and then give them the courage to step towards you and not away from you, all right? That that you would experience the, the glory and the power and the majesty of God and realize who you are and not respond the way the devil wants you to respond because the devil wants you to feel condemnation in that moment. Like, God, you're so great, you're so holy, you're so mighty, and I'm a worm, right? That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to look at your life and feel condemned. So when you feel condemnation in your life, that's never God. That's not how God acts in your life. The, the devil brings condemnation. God brings conviction. Condemnation shames us for what we've done. You can write that down. Condemnation shames us for what we've done. And the truth is, that's not the way God operates. God doesn't condemn us. He doesn't cause us to feel shame. God wants to come and bring us hope. And so he sends the Holy Spirit to us, and the Holy Spirit comes into our life and brings conviction. And conviction shows us how we can change. That's what conviction does, right? I'm just trying to show you that when you have a God encounter, not only do you realize how big God is and that he's there for you even in your darkest days, And you find yourself in that moment, and in the midst of that, in your soul, you're kind of analyzing yourself, and you're wondering if you should even be there. Don't go through condemnation. Don't go, don't let don't let shame come into your life. But thank God, because the Holy Spirit is there to you with you, saying, I'm going to help you, I'm going to give you the strength, I'm going to lead you in the way, I'm going to be a voice of comfort, I'm going to be a voice of wisdom in your life, I'm going to speak into your heart, and I'm going to give you a way to find real and lasting change for your life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what conviction does in our life. And that's awesome. He's saying God can save you. He can change you. All right, don't give up. Yeah, I know. I know you're looking at how big he is, and you're feeling very small right now, but God's got you, and I'm going to help you. The Bible goes on to say in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6, then one of those those little seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. So he goes to the, the, the altar where the blood sacrifice is, and he grabs one of the coals, And it says, with it he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So it's basically, it's like he's saying, uh, you know, look, I know that you're feeling small right now in the presence of God. And you're seeing yourself clearly. But you need to know this, that God is anointing you and he's touching you. And then in the middle of all that, there's this calling that comes. It says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? So here's Isaiah. He's having this vision of how big God is. All of a sudden, he, he's seeing himself clearly, and then God calls him. And we're going to talk more about that next week. I mean, I'm going to show you something next week. It's going gonna, it's gonna to touch you. And so God calls him, and God says, who will go for us? And then it's the words, us. That's the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're saying, we, ha- we have a purpose for your life. We have a plan for you, a destiny for your life. And Isaiah says, okay, here am I. Send me. So you'll realize when you have a God encounter on your darkest days that you can find your potential if you look for it. Like on your darkest days, God still wants to do a work inside of you. And that when we see ourselves clearly, write this down. When we see ourselves clearly, we see our future clearly. We see our future clearly. Some of the greatest things that God has ever done inside of me has been right in the midst of some of my deepest pain. I'm trying to tell you, if you are open to God during that time, then the pain can be a gift in your life if you learn to recognize it. I actually have a, a, a book 
that I'm working on right now that has a chapter where I talk about this. The book's called Brave, Finding Courage and Confidence in a World of Chaos. And uh, I'll just be honest with you, man, this book has been kicking my fanny. I've been working on it for a few years now, trying to get it out. In fact, before I could finish this book, I wrote another book that's actually in the publisher, or a publisher is looking at it right now. Uh, and I'm still trying to get this other one written, right, the one that I started. Uh, but in this thing, I'm writing about different ways where the enemy tries to trip us up and keep us from God's best for our life and God's destiny. And so in it, I'm talking about things like identity and purpose and overcoming fear, rising above your circumstances. I talk about grief and rejection and apathy and more. And one of the chapters in there deals with pain. And I really started doing some deep research into, into pain. C.S. Lewis has an uh, amazing book called The Problem with Pain. There's lots of great books. One of the books, there's a book by a guy who was uh, an Austrian psychologist, lived in the 1930s and the 40s, and uh, he was of Jewish descent. His name was Viktor Frankl, and he wrote a book that's been a bestseller for probably 80, 90 years, right? It's called Man's Search for Meaning. It's powerful. If you've never read it, I highly recommend it. And he was given this assignment after the Holocaust to take these Holocaust survivors who were suicidal and were now in a hospital, and he was given the assignment of taking care of them. And at that point, modern psychology said that the goal of humanity, Sigmund Freud believed it was pleasure, right? That the only way you're going to help them is introduce them to pleasure, make their life a little bit brighter teach them to play checkers, take them for a walk somewhere, go out and get some ice cream, you know, just give them some temporary pleasures and the pain can go away. Well, Frankel believed something different. He believed that if you did three things, it would change their life completely. He believed, number one, they had to do some kind of work that had meaning to it. Hint for all of you coasters that are watching, dream team. Just saying, all right? Secondly, relationships were important, that you need to be part of a community of people that, that where you find unconditional love around you. Second hint, small groups, they're getting ready to come up. We're going to be, we're going to be putting in, announcing our new small groups coming up next week. Third thing was, he said, you had to take their suffering and help them find some meaning. They have to have a purpose. He said, man without a purpose simply lives for pleasures. But it, 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 all that does is dull what's going on inside of you. That, that thing inside of you, no, I was created for something. There's a purpose. I, I, there's got to be more to life than this. And see, that's a question that we get to. This isn't my notes, but I want to camp here for a second because I want you to catch this. Because I think everybody comes to this point at some point in their life where they're looking at their life and they're going, there's got to be more to life than this. Right? Just the same old drag, the same old... Thing, you know, going out doing this, watch a little TV, go to bed, get up, do it all over again. You know, it, it, there's got to be more to life than this. And there is because you were called, not only called, you were created with the express idea that God created you for a purpose. You're unique. There is nobody else like you on the planet. There's nobody else that has the same mix of gifts and talents. And see, we look at ourselves and we say, well, I'm nothing special right? We're, we're the same people that can believe that every snowflake is different, but no, we're just part of the sheep that just goes and does. We're like lemmings just going boom, 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 right off the ledge. And that's not who we're called to be. You're unique. There is nobody like you. Nobody else has your same gifts and talents and abilities. And God wants you to learn that and go for that. There's meaning to be found. See, the things that Isaiah was going through, this, it was a dark day, Right? But he found that even in the darkest days, even in those moments, that there is meaning to be found in suffering. I always love when modern science catches up to what the Bible's been saying all along, right? Because, I mean, if you go all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, remember the story of Joseph? Joseph was this young guy, one of, one of a whole bunch of brothers, and God gives Joseph this vision. And Joseph sees this vision, and it's, you know, him raising up to a place of prominence and his brothers bowing down to him. He shares it with his brothers. They don't like it so much, so they decide, we got to get rid of him. First, they were going to kill him. They decide that's not going to work, so they put him in a pit. He goes into the pit, and they sell him into slavery. 
He goes into slavery. He winds up going to prison. He goes through beatings. He goes through all this different stuff. But finally, he makes it all the way. He, he winds up into the, the, the palace of Pharaoh as his number one advisor. The second only in power to Pharaoh or the greatest nation in the world at that time. He gets exalted up because of his trust and his faith in God. And circumstances have it that, that his brothers come to a place where they're, they've got to meet with him, but they don't know that it's him. And when they do realize it, Joseph looks at them and says, okay, I, I know you're feeling a little freaked out right now, but then he says this, in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God, everybody say, but God. God. Did you love that, man? But God's got another plan. God sees it differently. God's going to take the, all that pain that you put me through, all that stuff, and he's going to do something dramatic and amazing inside of me, and he's going to change our community. He's going to change things around me. He's going to point people towards himself. You meant it for good. Or, I mean, you meant it for bad. But God intended it for good. He was able to turn the pit, the beatings, the suffering into meaning in life. And I am telling you this morning, I am telling you that there is purpose in your pain. Come on, somebody. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. All right? If you'll allow God to come close in your pain, He can turn things around. In fact, the New Testament says the exact same thing. In fact, we sang it this morning. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes everything to work together. Say the next three words with me. For the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his what? Purpose. God's got a purpose for each and every single one of us. Now, we have a choice whether we walk in that purpose or not. Or we have a choice whether this promise can be fulfilled in our lives, that God will work it together for those who are called according to his purpose so we realize that calling and we step into that purpose and God starts working in our life in this amazing way and see God does it you see you need to understand we can redefine the bad day and it can be a springboard towards something great there's a story I love to tell and if you've been around coast you've heard me tell it before it's one of my favorite stories but it's just so appropriate I want to tell it again so bear with me if you've heard it if not Here's the story. There was this African king who had a friend. And his friend was one of those people that's just one of the most positive people that you would ever meet. In fact, everything that happens to him, he says, this is good. This is good. So, so if, it's, if it's raining outside, this is good. If it's sunny outside, this is good. If it's cold, it's good. You know, no matter what happens, he says, this is good. He's just very, very positive. So one day he's out hunting with his friend, the king, and he loads the shotgun for the king, and the king goes to shoot it, and it misfires and blows the king's thumb off. And the king looks at his friend who loaded the gun, and his friend says, this is good. And the king goes, no, this is not good. And, and matter of fact, you're going to jail. And he sends him to prison and puts him in prison. Well, about a year later, the king is out hunting again, and he gets captured by cannibals. And they're getting ready to cook him and eat him. And all of a sudden, one of them happens to notice that he was missing a thumb. And because the cannibals were a little uh, superstitious and that sort of thing, they believed that anything that wasn't whole wasn't healthy, right? And because he was missing a thumb, they let him go. Well, when they let him go, all of a sudden he started thinking about his friend that caused him to be missing a thumb and how all of it did work together for the good. And he, he said, I've got to go find him. So he goes and he finds his friend and gets him out of jail. And he says to him, I am so sorry. Tells him the whole story. He says, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I threw you in jail. I'm sorry that you've been there for a whole year. And his friend says, this is good. And he goes, well, how can you say that? How can you say this is good after all that you've been through? He said, I can say that this is good because if this hadn't happened, I would have been hunting with you. <laughs> right? Yeah. Come on, everybody. Say it with me. This is good. Yeah. So here's what you need to know. Write this down. My pain is either a jail that imprisons me or a school that empowers me. It's our choice, right? I'm just trying to help you understand that even on your darkest days, God is still at work in your life. God hasn't left you. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish this up really, really quick. Uh, this is getting away from us, so we're going to do this so fast. It's probably going to make your head spin. Bear with me if I start talking too fast. Just remember, you can go back and listen to the tape. Jeff, come on up. 
help me, uh, encourage me to get along out of this way. Here we go. There's purpose in your pain. Three responses. First one, write this down. Stop running from God and start running to God. Right? When you're going through a dark day, everything in your mind and your emotions will say, you know what, God? You've let me down. No, he hasn't. He's actually close and he's there for you to experience. That's why the Bible says in Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. I, I want to say something, and, and, and I want you to hear me. In, in, in fact, everybody kind of lean in for just a second. There's somebody here, and you've been running from God. Maybe you're watching online, and you've been running from God, and you've just kind of, it, it, you just need to know this morning, it's not going to get any better. As long as you're running from God, it's not going to get any better. You're going to keep struggling. You're going to keep hurting. And you think that maybe somehow blaming God is, is going to hurt his feelings and that you're punishing him. No, you're not. You're punishing yourself. And then there, there's somebody else. You're not running from God, but you're not actually running to him either. You're just kind of existing. And you're just going through that moment. And God is saying, if you'll come to me, I've got so much more for you. I've got so much that I want to do in your life. This is your moment. You're not running from, but you're not running to. It's time to run to, right? The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek God and you will find God under one condition, right? You have to seek him with all your heart. Maybe you've never done that and you're struggling with your life. And the truth is, until you go all in with God, you're going to keep fighting those, some of the same battles. It's time to say yes. What do you have to lose? Go all in. Seek him. Find him. Here's the second one. Write this down. You need to take the steps to grow. You need to take the steps to grow. See, one of the reasons that, that, that people have a bad day and it just messes them up, it messes them up because there's no depth to their life. Right? You're like a floaty out in the gulf. Right, everywhere the waves blow, you're just floating all around, just wherever, wherever it pushes you. And you need to be like a ship. You know, a ship in the Gulf, it feels a little bit of the waves, but it stays on course. Now, what's the difference between a floaty and a ship? Weight, glory, <laughs> stability, strength, maturity. It's time to grow. Maturity doesn't just happen. It's not something where you just walk along and all of a sudden you hit a certain time stamp and you go, oh, there it is. Maturity's happened. No, you've got to go after it. You have to make it happen. And if you don't grow spiritually, listen, you can go to church all your life and not grow spiritually. And I want you to look at me for a second. You'll still go to heaven, but life's going to kick the stuffings out of you. Right? You don't want to live that way. You don't have to live that way. You need to take some steps to grow. First Peter 2, 2 and 3 says, Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness, now that you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. There's more. See, some of you, you've never been baptized. And I don't understand that. I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that. You need to grow. You need to get stronger. Some of you, you are in a small group. For some reason, you've just resisted it and resisted it. And you need to get in there. Some of you, you, you don't trust God with your tithe. Even when he says, test me on this and challenges you. you. You need to grow. Some of you, you don't have a daily quiet time. Time where it's just you and God and you're getting alone. And it would change your life. See, this is your chance to determine, man, this year I'm going to grow. I want to be like that ship in the Gulf because the waves are coming. And you need to be ready. Here's the third thing. This is just trying to help you because I love you guys. Third thing, I need to allow God to use what I've been through. In other words, that bad day, right, to use it in ministry to help others. See, the thing that you think disqualifies you is actually the thing that does qualify you. You say, well, I've been through so much in my life, Robert. You just have no idea. I've made so many mistakes. I mean, they don't want me serving in ministry. When the truth is, you've probably learned some lessons. 
you've probably learned some things in your life that other people need to hear. And what you've been through in your life doesn't disqualify you. It actually qualifies you. I mean, look at some of the people that God used in the Bible. Just go through some of the list of names. Some of them went through some wild stuff. Some of them did some crazy, wacky things in their life. But when they went all in with God, he used their life in powerful ways. God will use people whose resumes are not so pretty. Why? Because God's trying to relate to a broken humanity. That's what he's trying to do. See, that's why when I tell you stories of my life, I don't just tell you the victories. I tell you the struggle points and the things that I've dealt with and, and, and places where it's been hard, the low points, the, the dark days. God uses, in fact, let me show you a verse. 2 Corinthians 1 through 3, I'm sorry, 1, 3 through 4. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Watch this. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can do what? He meets us in our pain so that we can take that pain and learn how God dealt with us in our pain. And when we see other people who are going through the same pain, we can say, can I just tell you what God did for me? Can I just tell you that God is no respecter of persons? And if God is doing it in little old me, he'll do it in you because he loves you and he cares about you. It doesn't matter the mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter the ways that you've blown it. It doesn't matter where your feet have been. It matters where they're going now. God wants to use you and touch you. It says, when they're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort. Everybody say, same comfort. The same comfort that God has given us. So that area where you hurt the most, that's the area where you can help the most. That area that was the source of your greatest misery can be the source of your greatest ministry. That's what God wants to do. That's how bad days are turned around. No pain, no gain. Pain can make a difference in your life. Bow your heads with me. Father, I just pray for people today who are facing pain, maybe in their marriage, maybe with their children, maybe they're having pain in their finances, pain in their emotions, maybe their souls are sick, their body is sick. We have things going on inside of us and we don't even know how we got there. God, let us take a step forward towards you this morning and not a step backwards. God, let us realize that when you move in our life, that you're working and that you're big, that you're a mighty God. Let us see how much we need to change. But also, Lord, how much you want to use us. Maybe you're looking at your life and saying, Robert, I'm dealing with a really tough time in my life. I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I'm dealing with some pain in my life. If that's you, would you just raise your hands? I want to pray for you this morning. I'm dealing with some really tough times. Come on, I think there's more. Anybody else? Hold them up. Just hold them up. I want to, if you're holding your hand up, I want to ask you to take another step. This is going to take some courage, but I want you to get up, and I just want you to place, find a place here at the front. I want to pray for you. Just find your way to the front. I want to pray for you this morning. Don't miss out on what God wants to do this morning. Don't miss out on a miracle. If you're dealing with hurt, if you're dealing with pain, don't let your pride keep you from this moment where God's going to meet you and he's going to touch you. He wants to do something inside of you. This is your moment. Now for everybody that's up here, we, could I get somebody to come and just stand behind somebody? Every person here, every person needs somebody. There's some that are sitting right here on these front rows. We just need somebody for each of those. But if you could, I just need somebody behind everybody laying hands on them. We're going to pray and we're going to trust God in this moment to do something amazing, to do something dramatic, to touch some lives. One right here. Yeah, thank you. Father, we just come before you in this moment. And Father, we bring our pain to you. If you're, if you're here and you came up for this moment, would you just say to him, you don't have to say it out loud, just in your heart, just say, God, I'm bringing my pain to you. Tell him that area where you're hurting right now. 
Father, we bring our pain to you. We ask you right now in this moment to touch lives, to minister to hearts. Father, I pray that in this moment you would give them a vision of how big you are, how powerful and how mighty. Father, that in this moment, I, 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 I come against right now, there's somebody here that, that, that the enemy's been saying to you that you're a failure. And I want to say to you, you are not a failure because you're still standing and God is still working and he hasn't stopped. He's moving in this moment. And you need to hear this this morning, that God is saying, I've got you. You are not a failure. You're not a failure. Keep pushing. Keep trusting me. You're getting a vision of how big God is. You're getting a vision of what he's doing in your life in this moment. And I'm telling you, whatever it is that you're dealing with, God can use that pain, God can use that hurt, God can use that brokenness to bring you to a place of healing, to bring you to a place of change. He can do something powerful inside of you in this moment, that he's here for you, that he loves you, that he's watching over you, and that he's got you. Lord, I thank you for your conviction that comes. I come against any condemnation. That's the voice of the devil. I speak against it right now, and I call it to death. But I speak that the conviction of the Lord is bringing hope into your heart right now. I speak hope into your life. Every one of you, I just want you to say this right where you are. Matter of fact, we're going to say this out loud. Matter of fact, everybody in this room, I want you to say this with me. I have hope. I, have hope. I receive the hope of the Lord. And see, God, I believe that you're bringing hope to our lives, hope to our circumstances. And the place where the enemy has said to you, it's never going to change, that's a lie. God says, everything can change. There's nothing too big for me. And if you don't believe it can change, you need to get a little bit bigger of a revelation of how big I am and what I can do and put your trust in me. We're learning to come to a place of relentless trust. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So, Father, thank you for every person that's here. Every person that's here in this moment. Let the comfort of the Holy Spirit be in their heart in this time of pain. Let your hope start to generate inside of their heart and do something powerful and mighty. In Jesus' name. Amen. Slowly begin to make your way back uh, to your chairs. And then just stay in the mood of prayer for just a moment. Head still bowed. Maybe you're here in this moment while every head is bowed and you've never said yes to God. You've never invited Jesus to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. Today is your day. This is your moment. I want to encourage you in this moment to just say yes to Him. The enemy's tried to keep you back, he's tried to fight you and stop you from doing this. You may be watching online, and I want you to know this is your moment. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to say yes to him. So if that's you, and you say, Robert, would you pray for me? If you're here today, every head's bowed, every eye's closed, no one looking around, we're going to give them privacy. But if you're saying, yes, I need to say yes to God today, can I just see your hand? I want to pray for you. Thank you so much. If you're watching online, I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you just to pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I bring you my pain, my hurt. I ask you to forgive me for my mistakes and the places where I've blown it. As much as I know how, I'm going to turn my feet towards you. I want to pursue you. I want to know you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to fulfill your purpose for my life. I ask you to do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, can we give God a good, good praise this morning? Yeah. So here's what we want to do. I know that we're running just a little bit longer. But we're going to give you one op more opportunity to respond to whatever God may be saying to you. 
And there's several ways that we can do this, all right? One, the band's going to lead us in a, in a song. We're going to praise him. And I just encourage you, if, if that's your response, then praise him with all your heart. There's also a communion station that's open on either side. The Bible doesn't say how often to take it, but it says when you do, do it in remembrance of me. And it's a time to remember the sacrifice of Christ and his great love for you. And that his love for you is unconditional and does not change. It's a great time to do that. There's a place for you to bring your tithes and your offerings. Uh, there's a little basket that's up here on the front. And then finally, there's going to be some people up here who would love to pray for you. If you need somebody to pray for you, uh, then you can be prayed for during that time. So as the band leads us in this final song, if you would stand to your feet, and you can respond in any or all of those ways. <laughs>
is that you realize that God is working in your life, that he is indeed a big God. You'll start to see yourself clearly, and you'll recognize that a big God can do big things inside of you. Move your life in an amazing way and move you towards the purpose and the calling that he has for your life. And I speak it prophetically over you today that some of you, you are taking your first step to God's calling and purpose for your life. You're taking your first step today towards what God is calling you to do. And there's new ministry ahead for you. There's new things that God wants to do in your life. He's going to use you for the kingdom in powerful ways. There's some of you that you're going to teach. Some of you are just going to, he's going to show you different ways to love people and to make a difference. Some of you are going to be encouragers. Some of you are, are going to be just students of, of the word. And, and, and you're going to help people to understand the word in different ways. God's just going to start moving. And I believe that. I believe a breakthrough is coming. And by faith, we're going to see miracles happen. How many of you say, I believe 2021 would be a great year for a few miracles? Amen. Well, thank you for bearing with us. I know we went just a little bit longer. A couple of quick things. Next week, we continue our series. I'm going to finish up uh, with a divine encounter. And, and I'm going to talk about hide and seek. Hide and seek. That's next week. I hope that you'll come. Think of somebody that you can invite to come and and uh, be with you next week. Uh, for those of you that remember, uh, last year, or I think it was maybe 2019, 2019, we put um, cross equals love signs all throughout our community. You guys remember that? We're getting ready to uh, actually do that again. We're gonna pepper our whole community with this sign on your worst day. I love you. We want people to know that. By the way, you'll notice it doesn't say Coast Community Church on there anywhere because we're not pointing them towards us, we're pointing them towards God, amen? It's a Jesus thing for our community. And there's a lot of great churches in our community. And if people wind up in any of those churches, it's a win, amen? And so we've got the signs ordered. They'll probably be about a week and a half coming. And when they come, we're gonna, we're gonna put about 150 of them all up and down the highway. We're going to need your help to do that. So uh, that's coming in just a couple of weeks. Well, one more thing. I want to do a blessing before you go. If you would, raise your hands a way of saying, God, I receive what you have for me. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here today. I pray that you bless them in all that they do, that you would pour your spirit out upon them, give them wisdom in all that they do, that they would walk in wisdom according to your word. Father, give them favor in the eyes of people that they come in contact with. Let your anointing, your anointing rest on their life. Well, I just even see that happening in the spirit. Let your anointing rest on their life and give them divine opportunities that they can tell other people the story of what you've done in their life in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great, great week.